On Wednesday, we went over Dune, right, which is provided this facility for having applications or processes that could use CPL0 as well as CPL3, right? So you could run sandbox code inside CPL3, for instance. So IX is a case study of that. Um, so we talked again about the VTX, makes this virtualizable. We have root mode and non-root mode. Each of those has their own set of CPL0 through CPL3, right? And so the idea is you run your virtual, mem virtual machine monitor in root mode and then run, let's say, your guest operating system in non-root mode or Dune process in non-root mode. Uh, in is there any connection between like, root mode and non-root mode and like, super users versus regular users? The naming comes from the same place, oh. but no, nothing, nothing beyond just that idea of one of them is really special and has more powers. So, and where root came from originally, I don't know, but that was way back when on Unix. Okay, so here's how network software works on Linux. We have the kernel. The kernel has access to this network interface card, which we'll call a NIC from now on. That's, give me a model number of a NIC. E1000, e exactly, good, good, good. Okay, so we have interrupts coming in with, with packets. Uh, we have TCP processing happening in here in the kernel. So TCP, right, controls basically these streams of reliable data. They come into a port, and then they'll get sent off to some application. So all of the applications that are running on this Linux box are all sharing the same TCP processing. Okay. So packets are coming in from the NIC and then getting dispatched out to applications. And conversely, uh, data is coming from the applications via a write call, uh, just like you would write to a file, and those get converted to uh, packets and then get sent out. So we have queues here of packets to be dealt with, either packets to be shipped out to applications, packets to be processed, packets to be sent out over the wire, and so on. Okay. And then an application is communicating with the kernel via read-write, and then instead of open uh, to like open a file, you will create a socket. And if you're listening, use accept. If you are trying to connect to something, use connect, and so on. Okay. We have to have a lot of locks because we have multiple threads that are dealing with TCP/IP, right? Multiple threads that may be dealing, for instance, with a NIC. We know that we've got the transmit queue and the receive queue, there's one of those. So we need to have locks to make sure that multiple threads aren't writing to it at the same time. Whoops. All right. So let's say we're trying to write a network server that is high performance. And in particular, let's look like at Memcached. So Memcached is, that is the next page, right? Okay, we're just turned. Okay, so memcached is an in-memory key value uh, store. In-memory is useful for this particular case because that means we should be able to handle requests quickly, right? We, we don't have to ever hit disk or anything like that. So different, let's say, from an HTTP server that may have to go to disk to read files or go to a database or something like that. High request late, let's imagine, and a lot of short requests. And this is actually true of, of memcached. Lots of clients, lots of potential parallelism. So lots of different connections to our memcached with different keys that could all should be able to happen simultaneously. Here's our goals we want. If we have a high load, we want a high throughput. Okay, so if we've got a bunch of requests coming in, we want to satisfy a lot of requests. That is, we want a high number of requests per second. On the other hand, if we have not a really high load, but a low load or a modest load, then we want low latency. By this, we mean that the time it takes to respond to a request should be quick. And in some ways, there'll seem to be trade-offs. You have to trade off one against the other. IX tries to satisfy both of those. And the other thing we want is a low tail of latency distribution. That is, we don't want to have something like our latency looks like, I don't know, uh, that, okay? Because that means there are some requests 
out here in the tail that are taking a long time. And if requests are taking a long time, that's bad. Let's just think, for instance, of a uh, web page. Right? How many different requests do you think are made to display an average web page? Order of magnitude. I'd say hundreds, probably, if you think of all the ad servers that are getting you know, uh, uh, pulled in. And assuming you don't have anything cached, right? it's got to pull in jQuery and all this other stuff. And so probably hundreds. And so you are, when you've got hundreds, you're likely to hit your tail on at least one of them. Okay? And if you are requiring all of them before you display, then you're in deep trouble. So let's look at the limits of what we might be able to do. If we've got 10 gigabyte Ethernet, that's about 15 million packets per second, smallest packets. If we use 40 gig Ethernet, well, it's about four times that. Okay? And 40 gig Ethernet, sometimes that's just sort of bonded together for 10 gigabyte Ethernet. Uh, RAM, we can deal with a few gigabytes a second. Interrupts, we can do about a million per second. So right there, we notice a bottleneck. Right? If we're having an interrupt on every incoming packet, we're going to be limited to dealing with a million packets per second, whereas we might have 60 million of these. Now, that's not quite fair. Do we get interrupted on any 1,000 on every packet? I don't know if anyone has actually, someone did interrupt. So right, when you configure your, the Ethernet controller, the E1000, you can specify, what is it, how, f how full it gets on receiving, right? How full, that is, it's, it's, it's like your gas gauge. How low do you let it go down before you go fill up more gas, right? And this one is, how full do you let the receive queue get before the NIC sends an interrupt to the kernel saying, hey, free me up some space, right? Fill up the gas, so to speak. So it can be, I think, a half, three quarters, something like that. So therefore, you're not getting an interrupt on every single packet. You might be only getting them on enough, however, however many packets is enough to fill half the buffer, let's say. What happens if you get one packet and only one? Does that mean your operating system would never be told? I can't wait for more packets to come in so I can get that one that's sitting there. No, because you can also set a timer that says, Please tell me when the buffer gets half full, or it's been, you've got a packet, and it's been X number of units of time. Okay. But what does that do if you have to wait for that X units of time before you get told about the packet? That increases the latency. Right? So if, you get a, you, if you've got um, low usage, right, not much data coming in, and you get a packet in, and then you've got to wait until you get that interrupt, until the NIC notices nothing else seems to be coming, then that slows stuff down. System calls, you can do a couple million a second. Contended locks, right? That is, you've got locks where the people are waiting, that's like a million a second. Moving stuff between cores, a few million a second. So that means all of a sudden, all of these really become bottlenecks for dealing with very fast, very high throughput. So if we're limited by Ethernet and RAM, we're, this is what they used to do at Google, right? So we would have these uh, TGIFs where you would see stuff like, what are we expecting to earn this quarter? But they would never give you actual numbers. You would just get to an order of magnitude. So this is two digits, let's say, of millions per second. Okay, so we can get you know, 10 to 99 million uh, packets per second from the Ethernet and the RAM. But if we're in interrupts and locks, we're limited to something less than you know, 10 million. So we're an order of magnitude difference. Does that make sense? So what is it we want to avoid if we want both high throughput and low latency? Give me one thing. Locking. Give me another. Interrupts. Give me a third. System calls. Those are what we're going to get rid of. Okay? We can't completely get rid of system calls. In fact, if we can't get rid of system calls, and we need to deal with system calls to deal with packets, how will we do it? Multiple packets. Multiple packets, yeah, exactly. Multiple packets per system call. So. Is 
uh, sort of any time you might use a database, really, where a, a read-only database. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think they may be writable. I'm not sure whether they they'll have a backing store or not, or whether it's just just read-only. So, um, so latency, right? Important, not just for web pages, but also you can imagine in the microservices. Uh, how many people are familiar with the microservices, microservices architecture? Right, the idea there, something Amazon is a, is a good example of that, where when you go to the Amazon web page, what you're actually doing is hitting hundreds of different servers, probably to do whatever it needs to carry out. So it's got a small server that has some few APIs that does it. In fact, a server that's probably uh, some one team is responsible for, and it has some negotiated API, and that then can be used by other clients that themselves may be servers and, and so on. So making any one request to their front end may cause a lot of requests to go out to the back ends. And it's going to sit there often and wait until the last one comes in. So, so latency matters. Uh, what causes latency? Network <coughs> speed of light? Round trip time for spin? So here's a question. A light year is a measure of what? Distance, okay, very good. So, a light nanosecond is how big? Exactly, it's one, about one foot. Okay, so remember that one, okay? So that say is if we need to go four yards, uh, trying to avoid metric, um, so that'd take about 12 nanoseconds, right, at a minimum. And you know who really cares about this? The high-speed traders, right? The ones who are trying to get three nanoseconds ahead of their competitors so they can trade earlier. Um, they really geek out on that. OK, so uh, how long it takes to actually get the packet across, uh, the interrupt that happens, any queue operations that we happen, sleeping or waking up, system calls that need to be made, moving data, and fetching RAM, OK? All that stuff. Uh, part of the ingredients for latency. <coughs> Mostly, it matters how long you're waiting, right? That's often what latency is defined for, just how long you're kind of sitting in a queue waiting to be processed in a variety of different places. Waiting, give me one place you're waiting. In hardware. In a queue. It ends with the word queue. We can also think of it as a buffer. And we're receiving data. A receive queue, right. It's, officially, it's not quite in the hardware, but it's still sort of, yeah. So receive buffer is one place, right? The packet comes in, and no one's actually looked at it yet, because maybe we haven't got the interrupt, or maybe we did get the interrupt, and we don't have time to deal with it. But let's say we haven't got the interrupt yet. And then we move it in. Maybe we've got another queue for dealing with TCP, TCP IP. As we're dealing, just there could be multiple queues, OK? Uh, Bursty arrivals cause queue times to, to vary a lot, increase their variance, uh, as do service times. So if it's taking longer to service something and shorter to service something else, that can increase those queue times. Structural problems, like we have multiple threads with different queues, and one of them's short and one of them's long, that can affect things. It's difficult to, to reason about in a complicated system, especially. IX you're going to see is. Uh, in some ways complicated, it's different from what you're used to, but it's actually fairly simple, I think. So it's built on, IAX is built on top of Linux, right? We're using Dune, built on top of Dune. So we're using this Linux kernel, kernel module. We're going to have a different API. Okay, so we're not going to be using the standard socket API for reading and writing data. We have a different TCP IP stack architecture. The TCP IP stack is not going to be in the kernel. So instead, it's going to look sort of like this. We're going to have, first off, our NIC is going to be different. Our, it's, I mean, it's going to be the same NIC, but we're going to use a feature that we weren't using before, which is a multi-queue NIC. 
So you can actually set up a NIC and say, I want you to give me separate queues for this. Okay? So a separate receive and transmit queue pair here, and a separate receive and transmit queue pair here. The transmit queues are kind of simple. In either case, you throw a packet into the transmit queue, and it'll get transmitted. The receive queue, we have to have some way of specifying how packets get sent to one or the other of these queues. So we're going to assume we have, we can program, well, we can program the NIC to say these kind of packets go to this queue, these kind of packets go to this queue. In particular, we'll use port numbers, right? So it's commonly used for TCP IP, right? When you connect to a machine, you specify a port number. What's the HTTP port number? 80. What about the HTTPS? Okay, I didn't know that one. And what about uh, SSH? 22. 22. All right, so they all have different ports. Yeah. Uh, the Beijing had mentioned insistent flow hashing. Like, I'm just thinking, like, if you have all these queues, you know, trying to send or receive something, like, does some kind of hashing come into play to know? Yeah, the hashing is basically just our port number. Yeah, I think source and destination IP may be it, the, although the source IP, yeah. It's a way basically to ensure that a given session, so which is connecting to a port from a given IP address, goes to the same place, okay? And so that's the hashing that'll be. Let's, let's say it's source IP, right, from outside of here and port number. Okay. We have our kernel here. In the kernel, we have what? How is it? more than a non-standard kernel. We've got a module in here, which is? Dune, right, the Dune module. So here now is our IX kernel, right? Below here is root mode, above here is non-root mode. Above is non-root mode, now we get to have CPL0 and CPL3. So in CPL0 is gonna be our IX kernel, right? Our IX kernel is gonna have our TCP IP stack. Think of it as having separate stacks, right? It's just separate threads running different stacks. So the stuff that goes in this queue is gonna to go to this TCP IP stack. The stuff that goes into queue two is gonna to go to this stack. And then on top of that, we have applications. In, we have applications in each application will have multiple threads. In this case, I'm just showing one application, but we could have multiple applications. Each thread talks to a specific TCP IP stack that itself then talks to a specific queue. Okay. One thread, one CPU. So we're going to use a dedicated CPU. Dedicated CPU. If we have a dedicated CPU, with a dedicated thread here in the kernel, we're avoiding locking. Okay, we don't have to lock on anything that's in here because it's only dealt with by a single core. Anything in here is dealt with by this separate core. We don't have to lock these queues, right, when we're trying to read and write from these queues because we've only got this single core reading and writing everything. Yes. Those one-to-one -one in reality? Those are one-to-one -one in reality. This, these stacks is the same code being executed on different, um, being executed by different threads and different CPUs and with different memory, okay? So these may have buffers that'll be different from these buffers. Okay. So don't need to lock, we just run flat out. Second thing we have is we don't have open, uh, sorry, accept, bind, connect, read, write. We have one API call or system call, which is run IO. Okay, and we'll look at that in more detail. But we do know one thing about run IO. It can support multiple packets. Okay? And run IO somehow is going to have to be able to send packets out and get packets back in because the application needs to receive data and then send it back out. Does that make sense so far? And what are we missing in the bottom from the NIC that we had in the previous diagram?
There's an arrow. Interrupt. interrupt. We're not going to do interrupt. We don't need no stinking interrupts. What are we going to do instead? Polling. Remember how I told you polling is the best thing always? Now, remember, we, in, in, we added interrupts because polling had a lot of overhead. Overhead. We have a lot of waste. And that is what we're going to be willing to give up here. We are willing to waste some CPU time to get high throughput and low latency. Okay? Because you can't, there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. All right, so IX is running in this non-root mode. We have these dedicated NICUs, dedicated cores. That's what the Linux kernel's involved in. So the, we're going to actually request these cores, request these NICUs from the Linux kernel, and then the Linux kernel's out of it, okay? Not involved anymore. It will have to provide access to our IX kernel to actually have direct access to the NICUs, okay? So we've got to be uh, talking to those NIC queues. So the application, right, let's say it's our memcached, makes system calls to the kernel to send and receive packets. The packet buffers are not copied. Okay, if you think about our application and then the IX kernel, and we want to send a packet to some buffer, we do not do a mem move from that buffer into some place here. So we don't have a buffer here and a buffer here and a copy. All right? What can we do instead? Well, we will use our page table to ensure that this buffer is I don't have a good diagram for this. Is it is available here, right? So it's in the address space here and here. Okay? And what's more, this is actually going to be a transmit descriptor. The address is going to point right to this. So we're not going to copy it into our transmit buffer either. We're going to just take advantage of the fact that in our transmit descriptor, we get to specify an address and a length, right? a physical address. We'll just make sure it's a physical address of this guy. Does that one make sense? So that means zero copying when we want to transmit. We've got a buffer. It's going to be passed on to the kernel. The kernel is going to go update the um, transmit descriptor. It's going to reference this buffer directly, and then it'll be sent eventually. Like we don't know how long it'll take while it's in the queue. That does mean that our API has got to be different. When we send a packet, this buffer is going to be in use even when we get returned. So sometime we're going to be told this is free again for you to use. But until we're told it's free, we can't mess with it. Does that make sense? Same op opposite way for the receive. So for receiving, we're going to receive into a buffer, and that buffer is then going to be provided to the application, zero copy. So the zero copy means we're not going to have to worry about the RAM speeds. Okay? We'll have to pay just once for RAM, either going from NIC to RAM or from RAM to NIC. But once it's there, we don't copy. Can you do zero copy with a regular kernel? Mostly. Okay. The problem has to do, again, with the fact that, well, in fact, how could you deal with it in a normal kernel that you want to, let's say, transmit a buffer, right? You want to do a write call in a buffer, but you want to make sure they don't mess with it until it's actually gone out. Indeed. The RCU, yeah, RCU, the read copy update. Yeah, but we don't want to change the application. 
So we don't, we, the application, as far as I know, they just make a write system call and they return and they can write to, the, write to it or not write to it and everything will be fine. Remap is copy and write on write until you're done with the data? Remap it is, so there's two ways. Yeah, you're gonna use a page table is the key. Either mark it as, well, mark it as an unwritable, okay? And then you have two possibilities. One, they try to write to it, put them to sleep until the transmit is done. Or say, well, we're not zero copy, we're zero point, we're epsilon copy, right? And so we're gonna go ahead and copy at the time uh, they try to write. Either one of those would work. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is not the only way to do zero copy, but it's certainly a lot easier. But isn't switching out the page table a relatively slow operation? Don't bother me with details. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we may be we may be paying costs. Yeah, paying other costs. That's that's true. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're gonna have a batching system call interface because system calls are too slow to support the speed of writing that we want to do. So we are going to contain one or more, I'm going to put these sort of system calls in quote, one or more operations, let's say. Because these are not really separate system calls. So they're one or more operations you can specify in a system call. Send, right, so this is send a packet. Done with the receive buffer. So this is, at some earlier point, I got given a receive buffer from the kernel with a packet. I have now finished processing it. You may have it back. So just as we had to be told by the kernel when it's done with a transmit packet and not to mess with it before then, the kernel has to be told when we're done with the receive packet and not to mess with it before then. Questions on that? Okay, so this is basically, uh, this can be reused by the kernel. And close, connect, accept, those kind of things, right? I'm done with, I'm done with this um, TCP IP connection. I wanna start a new TCP IP connection. I can accept TCP IP connections as a server and so on. And then on return, you get the result of each of the, I'm going to say operations again. Like it might have failed because the connection's not there anymore. That'd be an example of something that could fail when you're trying to send. Um, and then you also get told send completed. That is, this is, uh, buffer can be reused. by the app. And then told some information like this connection's terminated, a connection has been opened, stuff like that. Okay. How many packets can be sent in one call to run I.O.? As many as it wants. How many packets can come back in here, right, this receive, these are all packets, right? Receive is incoming packets. So the question is how many do we want? Let's say we're very first starting out. We have a TCP IP connection. We don't have anything sent out on the connection yet. We call run IO. We don't send anything out because we have nothing to send out. So basically there's nothing going on here. And we get a receive. Should it be the first packet in the receive buffer? Why just the whole receive buffer? Shouldn't we wait in case there are more coming? We'll call run IO again. We'll call run IO again. And if we wait to see if more are coming, we're increasing the latency of all the ones that are there right now. So what Ronel basically does is say, go grab all of the packets that are waiting. 
there is some limit, right? It's, it's actually uh, some maximum as to the number that actually will get received to make sure it's not some huge amount that then the application is going to kind of choke on trying to deal with, right? So I'm not sure what the number is, but in general, it's the packets that are waiting. Where are these waiting packets? In which queue? The receive buffer, right? The receive queue. What if this guy doesn't call run IO fast enough? What will happen to that receive queue? Packets will drop on the floor. Then what will happen? Chaos will ensue, right? They'll get resent, exactly. And in fact, it's kind of nice because in a normal Linux kernel, a packets will come in and they'll be grabbed and stored in the kernel for the application when the application tries to deal with it. But if the application's not dealing with it, the other guy doesn't know to slow down. This one is kind of nice. The application is not handling these packets quick enough, and the remote system then is going to be told to slow down via TCP IP back offs and so on. Yes? Because there are acknowledgments that happen. Okay. So when I send you a packet, I have, we number every packet, and you tell me the highest packet, the highest sequential packet you've received. So if I send you 44, and then you send me back something that says 44, that's an ACK, good. And then I'll send you 45. And I might even send 45 and 46 and 47 along the way to try and you know, increase our throughput. But if you now send me back still 44, 45, 46, and 47 are gone, so we'll have to resend them. Okay. So this is TCP specific, right? Like well, let's look at an example. UDP is another example, right? Unreliable datagram protocol. So this would be used, for example, if you're doing mm, uh, video, maybe, right? So, so if you lose some packets, let's just look at audio, okay? If you lose some packets, the best thing is not sit and wait for other ones to happen, and then we're going to be out of sync with you and I talking. Instead, just throw them on the ground. Worst case, you'll say, what? Yeah. OK. Uh, no, okay. Your hand is moving, though, so. Nandika. Uh, so how is this different than what we're doing in JOS? Like, if receive is not full, then are the packets also just dropped? Yes. If the receive packet's full, packets are dropped, indeed. And I don't know whether it's new ones that are dropped or whether it actually throws away old ones. Um, you could imagine it either way. I don't, I don't know. The remote system isn't explicitly told what's going on. It implicitly knows the packets are dropped because it isn't receiving its acknowledgments. So, um, OK. So, we're amortizing our cost of, pack, of system calls across multiple packets. And this is basically what your application looks like. You call run IO uh, with the input is stuff that's coming in, and the output is stuff that's going out. And then you go through every packet in the input, and you process it, and then you put it in the out queue to be sent the next time. Okay. So if you get two packets coming in, you're going to run this loop quickly. And next time you go out, you go ask. And if, it's, if there is not much traffic, you're going to be just getting a couple of packets each time, right? Maybe sometimes zero, sometimes one. But the latency will be extremely low because all it will be is how long it took you to process the, these previous messages until you get back around again and read the new, the new ones. Okay? So the latency may very well be smaller than if you had interrupts. Because interrupts, you have to set this timer that says, how long are you willing to wait? Okay. Questions about this? All right, run to completion. We don't like queues. So the only two queues we're going to have are the transmit queue and the receive queue. Everything else, we're going to just deal with stuff as we get them. So as we get a packet coming in, right? this comes into our receive queue. 
it goes into the TCP IP, right? And let's just kind of look at how this happens, actually. Let's actually start up here. So we call run IO. Run IO is going to go through and do its TCP IP stuff. And it's got a timer that's in here because um, that deals with things like I haven't heard an acknowledgement from my remote system. I'm going to go ahead and send the packet again. Or I haven't heard anything, and eventually we're going to give up on this connection. But there's some timers involved there. It's going to put this into the transmit queue. These packets are all done. Now it goes across, grabs this, all the packets that are there. And when I say grab them, it's actually not copying them, right? It's just, uh, without copying, providing them up into TCP IP, right? Because some of these packets may just be heartbeat packets, right? Just, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, and you're sending the same thing to me, and that way we both know the connection is open, but there's no data going back and forth. So some packets may not make it up into the app because the TCP IP stack is dealing with it. But those packets that are actually data packets will make it up to the TCP IP stack. Okay. And you know what? I'm, I'm, you're not get, it's not going to get the entire packet. It's going to get the data for the packet. Right? There's no need for it to get the checksum or, or the port number or all these other things. We have a slightly higher level. Right? So it's actually just providing the data, but still not copying it. So packets come in, they go into the application, they get processed, and the next time we call run IO, the results come back out and get sent out. There's no queuing. You just deal with a batch, deal with a batch of requests, and then send the responses. Deal with a batch of requests, send the responses. Part of the way we can do that is because the application is set up to be quick. This works well for applications which just won't take a lot of time, like you're not going to disk to deal with this, or you're not having to calculate pi to a million decimal places to deal with a request. Right? You can quickly deal with a request and in one round trip send back the result. But that's true for a lot of, it's true for a certain class of applications. All right. Does this make sense? Can I go over it in any? more detail or answer any particular questions. So, um, so when you call run.io, do you like already specify what information you want to send? And then when run.io returns, it returns with whatever stuff has been received. So yeah, you're going to say whatever you want to send. And this can be to it's not necessarily to the same socket, right? It could very well be to lots of different, well, not to the same connection. It could very well be to lots of different connections, likely is to lots of different connections. And it's going to return you both what the result was of each of those sends and whatever's waiting now as requests. So it takes CPU time. Right? It takes time to move these packets through these stages and queues and so on, which is what the normal Linux kernel does. Um, it's good if the application or your kernel thread has something else to be doing. Because if you think about this, if there's not much going on, let's say there's only one packet come, one data packet coming in every second or so. What's this mostly doing? Spinning. It's calling run IO as fast as it can, and every so often a request comes in and it says, Yay, I have something to do. And it does it and responds, and then it just keeps calling run IO over and over again. Okay? So this is the trade-off we're making by wasting this CPU under low load conditions. And remember, there's not just one of these threads running. There are several simultaneous threads running, each with their own CPU, to try and match to how, um, how many requests are coming in. Right? So if we have high load, we might even spin up more cores and more threads. Under low load, we might shed some of those. Like 
the number of codes. The parallelism is we do this over and over again. So we're going to have, because of the fact we have separate transmit and receive cores in the NIC, we can do multiples of these that are each doing the same thing. Okay. Limited by the number of cores. Yes. Yep. Limited by the number of cores, right? And we've got to reserve some cores. We know Linux wants at least one. Right? It it just doesn't work very well when all the cores are gone and it has nothing to do. Nothing, no, no cores left. Okay, so we complete the processing in one batch before we start in the next, but it's totally, really, really, really complete. It's complete as far as the driver is concerned, TCP is concerned, the application is concerned. It's until we actually get the reply into the transmit buffer. So run I.O. goes all the way down to the driver, returns the packet all the way back up to the app, and the next call to run I.O. has the reply message, and that goes all the way down to the transmit buffer. So we don't have to worry about any queues, except the transmit buffer, the sleeping or waking up, any contact switching, core-to-core -core transfers. None of that is happening, right? We're sticking all within a single core. We're never doing any contact switching, and we're never going to sleep. Also, this batch of pack, packet data will tend to be in the cache because we're not dealing with it here for a little while, and then we're going to deal with other stuff, and then deal with other stuff, and then come back to this, and it's dropped out of the cache. Right? It's likely to be in the cache. And we don't have a problem with the processing rate. So if you imagine we have multiple producers of data that does something to it and moves it on to a new stage, and moves it on to a new stage, and moves on to a new stage, and there's a queue between each of these. It's easy to get one queue backing up because the processor for that queue isn't running as fast as the other stuff. Okay, so we can get these queues. Is there, what was the timer for in the Yeah, the timer is going to deal with various TCP IP timings, like we have to send a heartbeat every so often, so for every connection, or we have to retransmit if we hadn't had an acknowledge, or we have to just assume the connection's over if we haven't heard those sorts of things. But they'll be separate for each implementation of the TCP IP, each instantiation of the TCP IP stack, because the timers are with respect to all the connections you have. There is a little bit of interaction between this TCP IP stack and one running on another core. Like, remember we've seen an ARP reply, if you guys are dealing with Lab 6. Well, which TCP IP stack is supposed to deal with that? I don't know, one of them, and we'll share that data among all of them. That shared data, we're going to have to be using a lock of some sort, but it's metadata about sort of our network as opposed to data that's associated with any particular connection. And it doesn't happen very often. So we'll have a tiny, tiny bit of locking and shared data. Well, if you have, um, let's say, more applications than cores, then how do you go about it? That's a problem. Yeah. So Don't do that. So you, can't, you can't go about it. You can't go about it. Polling rather than interrupts, we talked about this a bit. Um, if we've always got input waiting, there's no need to interrupt, just go get it. Right? So in high throughput situations, we don't need an interrupt because there's always stuff there because it's a high, you know, it's a, it's a high request situation. And in low request situations, there's going to be stuff waiting there for a while before an interrupt comes and gets generated. Okay? But the only reason we can do that is we're calling run I.O. over and over and over again and wasting CPU time. We're willing to waste that time on the polling. Um, so when do you check is a problem. And the way this works with run I.O is great. You're checking when the application, at least this 
thread of the application is all ready to handle any requests, any incoming data. How do we know? Because it called run IO, and it has nothing else to do. So the run IO works well, right? We've got this core. If we don't have any input, well, the core has not anything else to do if there's no input because it's dedicated to that. If there's input, grab it, return it, handle it. It never waits. That's a key. Right? So we're never waiting. Ah, there's only two things in the batch. I don't really want to send this you know, almost empty batch when there could be another request coming in soon. Nope. Send whatever you got right now. So you're polling more often on low load and less often on high load. More often on low load because you have less to process, right? This loop in here in your application, it runs fewer times because you have fewer messages. So therefore, run IO will get called again more quickly. And therefore, it'll go pull more quickly, it'll get the new requests more quickly, and your latency will be lower. As you have higher load, it's going to take longer to do this, and it'll take you longer to come back, and the latency will be higher. But that's okay, because if you have a high load, you're trying to increase the throughput. And this is what they call adaptive polling. Um, and it's sort of automatically adaptive. They don't have any, by dint of the API they have, it is adaptive. You had a question, Michelle? We're increasing the batching size on high throughput. Okay. We're increasing the batching size automatically because when we get back, we're coming back more slowly. And also, the number of incoming requests per second is higher. And so therefore, our batch is bigger. Does that, does that make sense? So in a, in a low load situation, our average number of packets per system call might be, could it be as low as one? Could be. Could be much lower than one. It could be we're calling run IO 10,000 times and getting one packet. Right. Okay, so now we want to use our multi-cores. One core can't necessarily fill up a 10 gigabyte ethernet. We have lots of clients. Okay, so this is a server like a memcached that has lots of clients, we're open to the, to the web, let's say, or we're, we're in Amazon and we have tons of different uh, clients hitting this server. The work is often independent. In the case of memcached, it is. It's this, you know, if we look at it as a read-only key store, they are independent. The problem with multiple cores is, again, contending on locks and moving data. So we don't like either of those. And so the solution is, just actually let's go back to our picture here just parallelize everything down here again separate application thread separate kernel thread separate TCP IP data, except a little bit, tiny, tiny bit, separate queue. All that separateness means no locking, no data movement. Nothing's moving from one core to another. It all stays on one core. So, Everything's on the same core. We don't use data on more than one core. So we don't share the content of packet. We don't share the NIC queues. We don't share the packet free lists or TCP data structures, except maybe just a little bit, right? Um, like, where's your gateway? Right? Where do I actually need to send these things to go on to their final destination? Um, what about the in-memory database? So we're gonna actually have duplicates of the in-memory database. I would suggest no. If it's read-only, we can afford to share it, right? If it's read-write, we might have to have some locking there. 
Um, and the NICs have these separate independent DMA queues for something like this, right? To have just this, this independent separate CPUs or separate threads. And we talked a little bit about the filters or hashing to pick the queue, right? Source address, where is this coming from? Who's our client? What port are they going to? Seems like a reasonable way to do it. And we have to use Linux to, to set up these, these queues, right? Because it's the one that's actually talking to the hardware. Um, yeah, so client IP and port. Um, flow consistent hashing, receive side, scale, receive side scaling. Receive side scaling is a weird name for this to me. Uh, the flow consistent hashing. Flow consistent, that is consistent with the flow, where the flow is a TCP IP connection. So I'm connecting to you, I have this sort of virtual circuit where I'm sending stuff to you and you're sending stuff to me. It'd be sure nice if the stuff you're sending to me all comes in on one core, because otherwise it's gonna get totally confused. Right, because we have these separate TCP IP stacks. We hope that hashing is uniform. <laughs> right? We hope that these will be balanced. Because if they're not balanced, we might have some CPUs that are getting overworked and some CPUs that are sitting around doing nothing except calling run IO. Uh, we talked about the zero copy, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, this works well to have high throughput for these multiple independent small requests, right? If you were just trying to saturate an Ethernet connection by writing one big file, this would not be the way to do it. And it assumes good load balancing. It's hard to see exactly how to load balance differently. So you could maybe reassign flows to different NIC queues. You'd have to somehow transmit the current state of a, of a flow of a connection to, to a different TCP IP stack. Could you maybe steal work from other cores? It's unclear exactly how. Uh, and it also assumes non-blocking request handling, right? We're not reading the disk. We're not going talking to another server. So this is a specialized form of application. Yes? Wait, can you speak a little bit about the load balancing cross cores? Because I thought like for a given code, like you make just one connection with the TCP IP and so it just needs to be that like, within its own code. So like at a metal level, how is the load balancing coming into play? It's hard. So one thing you could do is if you could somehow, if I've got a lot of flows talking to my clients and you've got just one flow talking to a client, maybe we can somehow get one of your flows over. But, but one of my flows, you can start handling. It's, it's a little complicated though. Are you gonna come to my queue and start taking stuff from my queue? And if so, how are we gonna make sure we don't collide with each other and so on. So it's, it's kind of complicated. This works well for the, how it's designed and we assume if we've got some uniform hashing that we just hope the, the queues, uh, that the CPUs or threads will have roughly the same amount of data. Uh, and what we're looking for, high throughput under high load, low latency under light load. Uh, let's look at some of the graphs. Um, so a single message going back and forth. So high load, low load, low load, right? So we can look at the latency and we can see between two IX servers, right? Because if I go from an IX server to a Linux server, the latency is gonna be higher because one end is, is high latency. So we can see that, uh, the, sorry, the latency is here. For some reason, they don't actually have a chart for the latency. They do th show here, I think it's interesting, the y-axis is good put, okay? Good put is good throughput. So we don't wanna be measuring how many packets are going back and forth. Because if half of those packets are retransmits, it's kinda useless. So good put is how much actually makes it 
from one application all the way to the other application. So ignoring all the retransmits and overheads and so on. And the upper bound on this is kind of what the Ethernet has minus whatever required headers there are. Um, so the low latency, um, we just are able to do stuff right faster. And the multi-core scalability sure looks a lot better than Linux, right? We are basically increasing linearly as we would expect because they're completely independent of each other. So it's just much different architecture. A perhaps network stack rather than one single stack. Why do we have our application running in CPL3? Why not just run it over in the IX kernel? So why not just run the app over here in CPL0? Yeah? If the app crashes, hard to debug. We might not trust the app, right? Uh, just the standard reasons we have kernels, uh, we could have. We can also run multiple applications. Right? There's no reason we have to have a single application running on this kernel. We can have memcached plus something else, or multiple instances of memcached with different data, and so on. Uh, some of the questions, what's adaptive batching? Um, we never wait for packets. We have an upper bound on the size of the batch, and that means depending on What's going on? The batch may be small or may be large. That's the adaptive one. Could a single app disable reception for all their apps by acquiring all the buffers? Uh, so you do a receive, I guess, and don't say that you're done with the buffer. So you just keep like holding on to the, the receive ones. So I guess in the same way that an application might just keep allocating memory more and more and more and more, so you could stop sending it uh, incoming requests until it has released something. What's zero copy? I think we talked about that enough. When would one, one not necessarily want high throughput and low latency? When one wouldn't be willing to pay what it costs, which is CPU cores. Uh, what's a data plane? So they talk about data plane versus control plane. The control plane is Deciding how things are going to work, the data plane is the actual sending packets where they need to go. So the control plane in, 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 in this particular instance talked about things like setting up the CPU cores, setting up the receive buffers, and things like that are kind of involved in the control plane. The hardware OS mis mismatch. Hardware can support high throughput and low latency. Many OSs don't. That's the mismatch. IX matches very well to the hardware. Um, about the, the single app disabling reception. So, but each app has like its own uh, like set of transmit and receive queues, right? So each app has its own transmit queue and receive queue. Right. So, wouldn't it only like disable that for itself? Well, here's yeah. what you can imagine, right? When you call run IO and you get back and you're given requests that is shared memory with the kernel. And so that could, if you don't acknowledge that you're done with it, it can't use it and would have to allocate new memory for it. And so if you just kept accumulating them, then you get more and more of the memory. Uh, Trade-offs, it's a different API, although they do provide, as I remember, a TCP IP library kind of on top of it that provides more normal TCP IP. Definitely one trade-off is possibly wasted or underutilized cores. Um, and the question assumed that you could only run one app, and that's not the case. RDMA, it mentions briefly, this is remote, uh, remote direct memory access. So the idea is I can read memory from your, your machine quickly. Okay? It used to be over this custom networking, and now it works over Ethernet. It's basically a way for me to read data from your um, CPU without it having to go to the operating system. So what happens is on your operating system, you configure that this NIC has access to this memory. 
And then I just talk to your NIC and say, give me whatever's that address, one, two, three. And it forgets the OS, just goes to the bus, grabs it back, sends it back to me.